Welcome to the Eden Podcast, where we think again about the Bible on women and men, and we start with a correct understanding of what happened in the Garden of Eden back in the beginning. Today we'll be hearing from Bruce C. E. Fleming. He's a former academic dean and professor of practical theology. The work of the True 316 Foundation is based on the research of Dr. Joy Fleming, who wrote the book Man and Woman in Biblical Unity, Theology from Genesis 2 to 3. Listeners like you are joining us as members of the True 316 Foundation and support the work to true the verse of Genesis 316 and the seven key passages on women and men. It turns out, when Genesis 316 becomes clear, all the other passages become clear too. You can learn more at our website, true316.com. That's tru316.com. And at the end of this episode, we'll tell you about a special gift we have for new members. And now, enjoy today's episode of the Eden Podcast. On the last episode of Season 9, titled Joy Story, I interviewed Dr. Joy Fleming as she recounted how God led her to study Genesis chapters 2 and 3 for her doctoral dissertation at the University of Strasbourg, France. If you'd like to get a copy of her dissertation, visit our website at true316.com slash shop. After teaching in French-speaking Africa as professor of Old Testament studies, when we returned to the States, she was asked to condense her 407-page dissertation for the average reader. She did, and it appeared as her book, Man and Woman in Biblical Unity, Theology from Genesis 2 to 3. We're serializing that book for Season 10 on the Eden Podcast. To summarize the third speech, the man was told two things about what he could expect in the future, rather than immediate extinction. One, God was now cursing the ground which would result in his gaining food through sweat and toil. And two, because death was at work in his body, he would eventually disintegrate and decompose into the elements from which he was taken. In mercy, God would give him borrowed time with sustenance for life. But the cost of his disobedience would prove to be terrible indeed. The second speech, Genesis 3.16 no curse is placed on the woman. This cannot be overemphasized. We already noted that speech 2 contained no curse, and in fact, none of those elements which speeches 1 and 3 shared. This has not impeded commentators throughout history, however, from claiming that the woman was cursed. The ancient Babylonian Talmud claimed 10 curses were uttered against Eve in this single verse. Unfortunately, the prejudices of such commentators have influenced the understanding most people have of Genesis 3.16 in a negative way. Not only is there no curse at all in this second speech, but there are positive words of hope striking in their reference to God's blessing. The woman likely overheard the words to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Certain information in particular would likely have caught her attention, given the death sentence she is under, namely that she will have offspring, and the subject will come up again in God's words to her. Later she will hear God inform the man of the toil, pain, sorrow, the Hebrew word is itzabon, that he will experience in wresting food from the ground. That very same word, itzabon, is used by God in his speech to her, in fact, it is the only vocabulary word from either of the other two speeches that occurs in the speech to the woman. Genesis 3.16a We have arrived at the most important section of our book. The first four Hebrew words in Genesis 3.16 form a double linkage, forward and backward, to the words around them. The link which looks back is in the fourth word. The link that looks ahead is in the third word. Each of these two words must be allowed to stand out and form its part in the linking pattern, or linchpin as it can be called. Modern translations of Genesis 3.16 that combine these two words into one idea only obscure these linkings and are in error. Turning to the second speech itself, God's words to the woman, the first four Hebrew words have been translated variously by English translators. The New King James Version says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. The New American Standard Bible says, 
I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. The New International Version, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. Of these three, only the King James Version conveys the sense of the Hebrew text. It is more accurate at three points. First, the text indicates that God is going to multiply not one, but two things. Notice the word and. God is saying, I will greatly multiply your sorrow, and I will greatly multiply your conception. Second, only the King James Version is consistent in using the same English word, sorrow, to translate its a bone in 316 and 317. Third, the final word of the phrase, heron, means conception or pregnancy, and not childbirth. Many versions such as the NASB and NIV have misconstrued 316a to be talking about childbirth, but such looseness in translation takes unwarranted liberties with the Hebrew text. These versions have borrowed a concept from Genesis 3.16b, which uses a different Hebrew word, etsev, that deals with what happens nine months after conception, namely, with effort you shall bring forth children. There, the word effort, or labor, properly belongs, but they have wrongly infused it into 3.16a, which uses the Hebrew word itzabon, and they have rendered the first four Hebrew words of 3.16a as if they constituted a Hebrew grammatical construction called a hendiatus. Such a construction might be possible when the grammar and syntax indicate that two words that would normally stand on their own should be read instead as one idea. In such an arrangement, the first noun would function as an adjective modifying the second noun, which might yield the dubious rendering, sorrowful conception. But the first four words in Genesis 3.16 are not arranged to indicate a hendiatus. A hendiatus is not required by the syntax or grammar, nor is it necessary to impose one to make the meaning clear. Furthermore, there are a number of difficulties with translating these words as a hendiatus, including the problem of conflating two distinct and important ideas, one positive idea and one negative idea, into a single very negative statement. There is also the problem created by changing the meaning of one of the four words, heron. As we shall see, good sense can be made of the Hebrew within the context, as reflected in the New King James Version translation. It will be necessary to consider each of the four words in turn. God's words to the woman begin with these four Hebrew words, Harba Arba, Itzabonek, Weheronek. Harba Arba means multiplying, I will multiply. This same verb, to multiply, was used by God in his words to the woman and man in Genesis 1.28 when he blessed them and gave them the mandate to be fruitful and multiply. But here in Genesis 3.16a, this same root verb, to multiply, occurs twice in a special Hebrew construction, which has the force of an intensifier. In English, multiplying I will multiply can be translated, I will greatly multiply. This verb, to multiply, is found in the same construction, harba arba, in two other places in the Old Testament, and that usage is instructive. In Genesis 16.10, God promised Hagar, I will greatly multiply, harba arba, your offspring, descendants or seed, the Hebrew word is zerah, so that they shall be too many to count. In Genesis 22.16-18, after Abraham demonstrated his willingness to sacrifice his only son Isaac, God said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your descendants, or seed, as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. In the statement to Abraham, the phrase, I will greatly multiply, harba arba, occurred in the context of a statement of blessing, initiating a great promise of numerous progeny. And the assurance to Hagar, while not accompanied by a blessing, also included the word descendants, or seed, Zerah, and was certainly positive and encouraging. In both instances, the expression, multiplying, I will multiply, is used by God as the speaker, is linked with descendants, seed, and the implication is strongly positive, as God gives a promise of great hope. The word Zerah is a Hebrew singular noun that can be used in a collective sense. While the word Zerah, descendants, seed, is absent from Genesis 3.16, the idea is not. For the term Heron, I will greatly multiply your conception, 
is similar to Zerah. I will greatly multiply your descendants. Furthermore, it is a matter of no coincidence that the very word Zerah, seed, is present just a few words earlier. It is found in the final statement to the serpent in 315, immediately preceding the speech to the woman. Picture an arrow pointing from your conception in verse 16 to her seed in verse 15. 315. I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. 316. I will greatly multiply your conception. Here is the point of this discussion. God's first words to the woman ring out a note sounding like blessing. It sounds almost as though God was speaking a word of blessing to the woman right in the middle of two speeches of cursing. And that comes close to describing what is happening. Though God pronounces no new blessing on the woman here, the choice of words poignantly conveys the positive nature of God's message of hope. God assures the woman that the sentence of death will not reverse the blessing previously conferred in Genesis 1.28 with the mandate to be fruitful and multiply. In fact, God adds a new promise to the original creation blessing. God personally ensures that she will conceive. God will greatly multiply her conception. Furthermore, as she learned from the previous speech, her offspring will defeat the enemy, crushing the serpent's head. But what of the third Hebrew word, itzabon, toil? What does God mean when he says he will greatly multiply your toil? The Hebrew word itzabon means toil or sorrow. It refers uniquely to the sorrowful toil that will be required to obtain food from the ground which the Lord God will curse. The word itzabon also occurs three times in the Old Testament. Usage of the word in its other occurrences is instructive. Toil, or sorrow, is used to describe the man's experience in acquiring food from the cursed ground, 317. The other occurrence of the word in Genesis 5.29 shows a usage identical to 317. Quote, Now he called his name Noah, saying, This one shall give us rest from our work and from the toil, it's a bone, of our hands, arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. It's a bone is associated directly with the curse on the ground. It is specifically that toil of the hands needed to cultivate the ground that God cursed. In God's words to the woman in Genesis 3.16a, he uses the word itzabon, speaking of the same kind of toil as when he speaks to the man in 3.17, just as in Genesis 5.29. God is describing toil involved in working the ground which the Lord God curses. His statement to the woman is proleptic, that is, anticipatory or suggesting in advance something to be explained later. One might picture an arrow descending from the first use of the word without explanation to its appearance in the next verse with explanation. Verse 16 says, I will greatly multiply your itzabon, toil, with an arrow pointing down to verse 17. Cursed is the ground. In itzabon, toil, you shall eat of it. This understanding is supported by the structure employed by the author of the Genesis text. The technique used can be called a linchpin construction a linking device more technically described as the interlocking crossover point of an introversion or chiasm. Isaac Kikawada noted that a linchpin construction is used in Genesis 11.5 at the center of the Tower of Babel story. There are two linchpins in the larger passage of Genesis 2 and 3, and they correspond to one another. The first linchpin occurs in Genesis 2.8, in the middle of episode A. The other linchpin is found in Genesis 3.16, in the middle of episode A prime. In these two linchpins, a middle verse is linked to each of the two surrounding verses by pointing words, one pointing forward to the same word or concept in the next verse, one pointing back to a word in the preceding verse. In Genesis 3.16, the word itzabon, toil, proleptically anticipates the reference to the same word in Genesis 3.17, where God actually curses the ground and explains its impact in terms of toil. And the word conception points back to the prior mention of her seed in Genesis 3.15. 3.15. I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. 3.16. I will greatly multiply your toil and your conception. 3.17. Cursed is the ground. In toil you shall eat of it. In summary, God packs good news to the woman into four Hebrew words in Genesis 3.16a. God tells the woman, 
I am addressing you in between my dealings with those two rebels, the serpent and the man. 1. I am cursing the soil because of the man, but it will affect your life. 2. I have told the serpent your offspring will crush his head, and I am telling you that you will indeed conceive that promised offspring. However, the translations of the New American Standard Bible and the New International Version make these opening words to the woman sound as though God is inflicting a curse on her, even though God places no curse on the woman. Instead, the first words God uses are elsewhere associated with blessing. Yet, God's words are not all good news, but mixed. God is giving her information of the bad news, good news sort. The good news linked to the preceding speech is that God will personally ensure that she has multiplied conception and that her descendants will include a deliverer from her enemy. The bad news linked to the following speech is that God will multiply her toil in securing food when he curses the ground, as the man will experience as well. Thanks for listening to the Eden Podcast, brought to you by the members of the True 316 Foundation. Research into the Old and New Testaments by Dr. Joy Fleming and Rev. Bruce C. E. Fleming forms the base of all our work. Joy is a former Old Testament professor and is a practicing licensed psychologist. Bruce is the author of the Eden Book series, which starts with Book 1, The Book of Eden, Genesis 2-3. to we invite you to become a donor member of the True 316 Foundation as together we seek to true the verse of Genesis 316 and related passages. When you become a member, we'll send you an autographed copy of the Book of Eden. Sign up today by going to true316.com member. That's tru316.com member.